Hello, welcome to Bible Bites. I'm Shane Vandyvreed, pastor at First Baptist Church in Stanton, Michigan. This video talks about alignment. In Psalm 19, the first six verses, we see uh, the psalmist describing the glory and majesty of God, our Creator, through just observing the heavens and all that are in them. They, they testify to uh, God's creation, to his wisdom, to his creativity, to his existence. When we get further down into Psalm 19, uh, we begin to kind of change course a little bit and show that God wants more than just to uh, prove to us or show us his majesty, his glory, and his existence. He wants to show us that he is the divine ruler. He didn't just create everything and then is standing back and watching how things unfold. He is intimately involved in creation, and he is the divine, authoritative ruler of everything we see and everything we don't see, both in the heavens and throughout all creation. So I want to start in Scripture by taking a look at verses 7 through 9. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. So we see here in these uh, three verses, seven through nine, that God didn't just create everything. He is the divine ruler, and therefore uh, he has established what he expects. He's established laws and orders and expectations and judgments for failure to align ourselves with his expectations. And so we see here in three verses, six almost rapid-fire uh, words that describe how God is involved in human life throughout our history. And so when we see the heavens and the proof of his majesty and his glory and his existence, we wonder, okay, who is this? What does he expect from me? What can I do to be acceptable in his sight? What can I do to please him? How am I supposed to live my life? Well, because God is the divine ruler, he provides us with the information to do that. And the first thing he says here in verse 9 is the law. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The law is a binding, enforced rule of conduct, how we are to live, to practice our life, living uh, in society with others, uh, even when we're alone. How are we supposed to conduct our lives? Well, there are laws that are binding and they are enforced, and that's what we see here. The law of the Lord is perfect. The next we see is the testimony of the Lord, that it is sure and that it makes wise the simple. What is a testimony? This refers to the Decalogue, which is the tablets that Moses received from the law when the finger of God himself wrote on those commandments the Mosaic law, the instructions, those laws that are binding in and enforce rules of conduct, God wrote down as a testimony on these stone tablets to give to Moses to teach 
the people of Israel. Then we see the precepts of the Lord. They are right and they rejoice the heart. A precept is a command. It is a principle that establishes a, a rule or an action. In other words, a precept is a specific, if you will, application of the law, of a particular uh, binding enforced rule of conduct. The, the precept applies that general law to specific areas in our life. And so precept upon precept uh, we see throughout Scripture, and uh, we learn them and can discern them through the laws how to apply them in our life. The next we see is the commandment of the Lord is pure and that it enlightens the eyes. It, it, help, it gives us that inner deep understanding. Okay, And these are commands. A commandment is an order that is issued, but not just any order. A command is something that is issued to us by one who is in power, one who has authority. And who greater than God himself? When he issues a command, then we are obligated. We are bound to obey it. The next we see is the fear of the Lord and that it is clean, that it endures forever. And what is uh, having the right fear of the Lord? What does that look like from um from an individual, how are we supposed to properly fear the Lord? Well, the fear of the Lord, beyond being the beginning of wisdom, as we read in uh, sections of Proverbs and other places uh, in Psalms, that the fear of the Lord is having a profound reverence for him, revering him. And a fear and revering him means to honor, honor him above all else. He takes top priority. He's in first place. He's on the top shelf. He's the one that deserves complete and total honor above all things. Honor and add to that awe, that awe, that majesty, that being overwhelmed at who God is and add to that respect, complete and total, pure, honest respect for who God is, and for everything that he tells us. And, and then devotion, being devoted to him. Devoted uh, with complete loyalty and without fail, uh, consistent and pure in our devotion to God. This is what it means to have a fear of the Lord and that it is clean and that it endures forever. And then the last one is judgments. The judgments of the Lord that they are true, and that they are righteous completely. So what is a judgment? It's simply an authoritative, a formal, divine sentence. It's taking a look and applying all those laws and uh, those precepts and commands and seeing, were they followed? Did God's people align themselves with his laws and precepts and commands. And he will judge with all wisdom and discernment to determine whether they did or whether they did not align themselves fully. And so he makes judgments based on that. And so God shows us his glory and majesty in the heavens and throughout all creation. And then he gives us written testimony that shows us what his laws are, his precepts and his commands, so that we might properly fear him, follow him, and obey him, to align ourselves with his laws, so that when we are judged based on what we have thought, what we have spoken, and how we have practiced our life, his judgments will come down and be favorable. Now, there are more verses in uh, Psalm 19, and I want to take a quick look at them as well, because uh, let's take a look at verses 10 and 11. 
they, which is referring to uh, the laws, the testimony, the precepts, the commandments, the fear, and the judgment. Uh, of the Lord, they are more desirable than gold. Yes, than much fine gold. Not only that, they are sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. So all these things of the Lord, his laws, precepts, and commands, they are greater, more desirable. We should want them so much more than anything that the world has to offer, even than the greatest wealth. Not only that, they satisfy our deepest desires. Might not seem like that, but this is how the psalmist uh, refers that second line of verse 10, sweeter than honey, even than the honeycomb. How do we know whether something's sweet or bitter? By taste. And what is taste? It is, a, uh, it is something that our flesh, our, our human nature, desires in order to satisfy ourselves. We long, we pursue things that we like, that taste good, that feel good, that uh, provide us with amusement. These are the things that we tend to chase after. We don't have to chase after these things in, in the world because God's law, his precepts, his commands, they provide that satisfaction. They are sweeter than anything that the world has to offer to us. And we are warned, if we are truly God's children, we are warned by all these things, laws, precepts, and commands. We are warned in that if we keep them, if we align ourselves fully with them, there will be great reward. Isn't that wonderful? Now, the next two verses provide uh, something that I really kind of want to hone in on here for just a moment. In uh, Psalm 19, verses 12 and 13, Who can discern his errors? Acquit me of hidden faults. Also, keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. What is the psalmist talking about here? Um, errors? Talks about who can discern his errors. Well, it would be helpful if I just add in one word. It will help us understand who the psalmist is talking about and who does his refer to. So I'll read it this way. Who can discern his own errors? Now, I know that uh, in my own life, and you can readily identify with this as well, that we tend to look at our own lives with a halo effect. We tend to be lighter in judgment upon our own thinking, our own speaking, and our own actions because we are so good and adept at uh, justifying uh, our own position. And this can be a dangerous problem, and it's an inherent thing in our fallen fleshy, uh, selfish, self-centered human ways, okay? I see and I even mentally agree that God is God and that his laws are good, pure, and true, and that they are righteous, and that I ought to follow them. I might even be able to quote them verse by verse, precept upon precept. I may know them all, which I don't, but even if I did, and I completely agree with them, and I even teach others about them, and I proclaim the laws and precepts and commands of the Lord, that doesn't mean I am following them myself, because we have a tendency to walk through life with blinders on when it comes to analyzing our own life. We, we wear dark glasses. We look in a dim mirror when we reflect on who we are. 
we can point out how other people might be failing and not aligning themselves to God's laws, precepts, and commands. Uh, we might be able to point out how they are failing to meet them. But when it comes to analyzing ourselves, we'll give the perfunctory or cursory um, example of how we too are failing because we want to be humble and sometimes we even elevate humility to something to be glorified. And so we will point out how we too are sinners and how we fail. But that's almost just to look look at ourselves and have other people's look at us that, oh, look how humble and, and, you know, how much humility he has. Isn't he great? Isn't he holy? Isn't uh, he a great child and servant of God? And so we'll see that um, as almost a benefit to ourselves to point out some of our own failings, some of our own errors, some of our own sins. But we don't go below the surface. We don't dig deeper. And because we don't, we find ourselves out of alignment. And this is what the psalmist is talking about. Who can discern his own errors? It's very difficult. And so he asks God, essentially, as, as is pointed out in so many other passages, uh, particularly in the Psalms, Search my heart, O oh God. Search me. You, God, can see my hidden errors. And so I want you to acquit me of all hidden faults. God, please continue to provide grace and mercy over me because I am a sinner. And I don't even know how much of a sinner I am because I can't see all of my hidden errors. And so, God, please overlook those, acquit me, cover me with your righteousness, and then teach me your law so that I might apply them even in those hidden errors. And, and here's the thing. It can be very difficult to align our practices with God's principles. It's so much easier to align God's principles with our existing practices. And that's a part of that justification process that we go through. It's a part of um, using situational ethics. You know, if only you knew what I'm having to deal with, you know, with um, this situation, then you would understand I am fully justified, even though it might fall a little outside of God's uh, laws and his precepts, even he would authorize me to act this way, to think this way, or to um, speak this way in this situation. But that's backwards, isn't it? God doesn't give us allowance um, to bend his laws. He wants us to follow them in all situations. And so there is no justification outside of the blood of Christ, that is. Um, but when it comes to judgment, God is going to judge fairly, righteously, uh, and with all discernment, looking at uh, the deep recesses of our heart, because he knows us inside and out. And <coughs> it says here, in verse, thing, uh, verse 13, he says, Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. What is presumptuous? Presumptuous is uh, assuming something without proof, without authority. It's taking something for granted. The dictionary even uses the word in the first listing of audacity. It's, it's almost like doing something even when we know that it's wrong. We're taking for granted that God will either forgive us, cover us with the blood of Christ, and we're taking for granted um, his loving nature. And even though he's said, do this or don't do that, 
we decide to disobey anyway. The audacity to disobey, to misalign ourselves, our thinking, our speaking, our acting, to misalign that with what God has said through his testimony in his law, precepts, and commands. We need to align ourselves. And let's just finish up with verse 14, which says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So the psalmist is saying, listen, this should be our attitude. This should be our, our daily way of thinking, our daily prayer, is that we want everything about us, the meditations or the, the thought life that we keep private, that those need to align with God. How we speak, what we speak needs to align with God. And our actions, our conduct, the way we practice life needs to align with God and all of his precepts and principles and laws. We need to align. What happens when something is misaligned? I have several examples. Uh, I remember as a child, uh, I used to have a, a lot of Hot Wheel cars. I used to like collecting them and getting new ones and had little box and carriers for all the different Hot Wheels cars and trucks that I had. And then I also had uh, those Hot Wheel tracks and how you would put those uh, bright orangish, yellowish tracks together and you would put one up and affix it up high and then you would let the car go down and, and it would follow the track all around. It would follow the track. The car was aligned on the track. Then there was uh, these, these add-on things that you could get where a hot wheel track would allow you to do a loop, right? And then you could also put a jump afterwards and then uh, the car would continue after the jump back on the track that you had laid out further. But if the track is not aligned correctly through the loop-to-loop -loop, and if the track uh, from the jump where it leaves off and where it lands, if that's not aligned, we have disaster, we have failure. It doesn't work. And what about like with a motor? A motor shaft needs to be aligned with a drive spindle so that as it turns and it transfers that power, that energy to the drive shaft to uh, do whatever function it is that that equipment is designed for, um, they need to be aligned right? They need to be aligned so that you can transfer efficiently and effectively as much of that power as possible without loss of energy. If it's misaligned, it might still work, but it's not going to work as well, and it's not going to last long. The motor's going to burn out. The dry shaft is going to burn out its, its bearings. But when it's aligned, it works, and it works well. And then with the picture uh, in this video to start off with and we'll also end with is this idea of a bridge being built between uh, two edges uh, over a chasm. And as the bridge is being built, it's being built from both sides uh, to be able to get the job done uh, quicker. But what if the bridge is not aligned, and you've got the height here is much lower than the height coming from the other side. It's misaligned. It's not going to work. Or even laterally, if they're misaligned. They might be the same height, but they're, they're misaligned uh, laterally. It doesn't work. So that's kind of the same thing. We need to keep the big picture in perspective. And the psalmist helps us do that in the beginning part of Psalm 19. Look at the glory and majesty of the heavens of God, of who he is and what he's done, to help us realize that we want to, that it's even in our own best interest to align ourselves with God. How do we do that? 
Well, he's given us that in all his laws, his precepts, and his commands. Well, I hope this video on alignment uh, has helped you understand. I hope it's given you a better appreciation and understanding for Psalm 19. And I hope that God helps you and helps me further understand and fall in love with his word, with his laws, his precepts, and his commands so that we might delight in them, so that they might guide us and show us how we ought to practice our lives, both in the thinking, in the speaking, and in our actions. Well, until next time, I pray that the Lord blesses you, that he keeps you, and that he gives you his peace. Thank you.